Thank you, Jonathan. And in fact, I was thinking this morning, I thought, oh, it is just so nice to be on this side of the church today. Um, although I spent about an hour and a half on that side before we came. But I, I got to tell you, I, um, I, I love your kids. I, I just really am thankful for them. And I, I am just so thankful that I work with Pastor Claire. She sees the kids K through sixth grade. She is absolutely amazing. I just love her. She has been such a blessing to this church to come mm -hmm. alongside. And um, I just, I just, I look at your kids, and I know she loves your kids so much. Her heart and my heart is to give a foundation to your children in the Word of God, so that they will grow to love God and love His Word. And so, um, I also just want to thank my team. I don't know if you realize it, but there's a number of volunteers back there every week. I have four classrooms, two people in each. Every week, they need to be there. Um, she has so many volunteers, and uh, they do an awesome job. Thank you so much. Give them a hand. As I was uh, asking the Lord, what, what in the world do you want me to talk about? I, I realized that this year, I've been serving God for 49 years. Next year, it's 50. Yeah, I said, oh. <laughs> and uh, I thought to myself, Wow, this is like amazing. When I was in college, I, I made a really good friend. She shared, shared me about Jesus Christ. She talked to me about it. You know, when I was raised, I always thought God was out here somewhere, and I was here somewhere, and I had to do all these deeds in order to reach him and for him to love me and for him to, to work in my life or for me to get to heaven. And as she shared with me the realization that had nothing to do with that, that he loved me. It was about relationship and that he wanted to be with me 24 7 because he made me, he understood me, he loved me. And I, it, it radically changed my life in view of God. And um, I came to a place where I opened my heart. And I got to tell you, I love him more today than I did 49 years ago. He is a powerful, awesome God. But what started to grieve me was the fact that. In my 49 years of ministry with my husband and serving God, there has been so many people that have come across our paths who have had the same experience with God, who were actually so on fire for God, leading people to the Lord, seeing him in ministry. And today, they're either put God on a back shelf and they're not even serving him anymore. And when they need him, they call or They've turned their back 100% on God and said, there is, no, there is no God. I don't believe it anymore. And that broke my heart um, when I see people like that. And I said to the Lord, why? Why is it, Lord, that for me, I was able to stay strong, and I pray that I can stay strong to the day I die like the Apostle Paul. I want to serve him to my, the day I'm in heaven with him. And um, I came across a king in the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament because the stories there are very real. They are real. And they set some principles for us. Now, we're under the new covenant of Jesus Christ and of the shedding of his blood. And we're cleansed by him. And I thank God I didn't live in the Old Testament. I don't know if I could sacrifice that many lambs and goats for all my sins. Um, I'm just an animal lover, and I don't think I could do it. But... I thank God that he, Jesus came and died for me. But the Old Testament has great principles for us to live by. And so I came across King Asa. It's in 2 Chronicles. We're, I, I put for your reference 2 Chronicles 14 to 16. Those are all the chapters. I'm not reading them all, but that's where the story is for you. Let me just give you a little background about King Asa. He, um, when he became king, he became king of Judah. Um, the Bible says that he, was, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just like his ancestor, King David, did. King David was one of the greatest kings of Israel. The Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. And so King Asa comes along, and now he's king of Judah. At this time, Israel and Judah were split. You had the northern kingdom. You had the southern kingdom. Um, they were at war with each other. Um, it was Israel was the northern. Southern was Judah. And it's sad because Israel, most of their kings that ruled during those years were what we, they would call evil. They did not serve God. They, um, they oppressed the people. Sin and iniquity, which is rampant in the countries, um, it was not the greatest places to live. 
But once in a while, Judah came across a king like Asa, who did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. And it's really cool because when he became king, what he began to do was he began to bring the whole country back to worshiping the one and true God. See, the land was just filled with idols, and it was filled with a pagan worship and all different gods. And he went around, and it says he removed the foreign altars, and he uh, uh, took down the pagan shrines, and he smashed the sacred pillars, and he got rid of the Asherah poles. Asherah, I looked up, she was the goddess of, of motherhood and fertility. So people would go to these gods to worship them and ask for help, but none of them were true gods. Okay, there was only one true God, and God had commanded his people to serve him and that he would take care of them. So Asa gets into, uh, into uh, office, he commands, he literally commands the Judah to seek the Lord, to obey God's laws and to obey God's commands. And so the Bible says that Asa and Judah experienced a great time of peace. And we see during that time of peace that Asa not only spiritually brought the country back, it was almost like a revival happening, but he also built up his country. He fortified his cities. He built up his army, and God granted him peace. How do we stay strong? Number one, strengthen your belief system. Strengthen your faith. We can't stay strong unless we strengthen our faith. These are simple principles, things that you've probably heard many times. But that's exactly what Asa did. He saw the corruption that was in the world, his country. He saw what was happening all around him. And he took authority and began to put into place the things that the people needed to learn so they could obey the one true God. You know, I, I, I tell you, when I, I came to know Christ, I realized how corrupt the world really was. You see, all of a sudden, I was reading the Bible, and I saw the Bible, uh, biblical view, and the standard, the plumb line, you might want to say, that God set for us. And yet, the world is somewhere over here. Here's the plumb line, and here's the world. The worldview is somewhere over here, and they just didn't match up. And uh, for me, when I came to, I mean, it was like amazing. I just did everything I could to strengthen my faith, to get strong in the Lord. In fact, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he said to them, I'm going to send you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. What was Jesus t saying to his disciples? He's talking to them and he's saying, look at, in Matthew 10, 16, I'm sending you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Well, what do wolves do? They eat sheep. I mean, they attack them. They, they, that's why you have shepherds to guide, the, to guide them and protect them. And he was saying to them, look at, you're going out into a world that is going to come against your faith, is going to come against your morals, that you are not going to line up with things of the world, and people are going to come against you. They are not going to like it. I think to myself, oh my gosh, that's exactly what's happening in the world today. I mean, I turn on the news and I think, man, how far can they get from God's word? They're way over here, the way they talk and the way they behave and the way they do things. And, um, and then he says, be as wise as serpents. I thought, what do you mean wise as serpents? Well, I believe Jesus was saying to them, listen, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you need to be wise you need to know how to respond when persecution comes, when people come against you, when things don't go right in your life. The only way to do that is to strengthen your faith. He also says you need to be gentle, um, as harmless as doves. God hasn't called us to be combative. God has called us to love. And I think that is the thing that really caused me to change my heart towards God was his love. I mean, when someone truly, truly loves you for who you are, accepts you for who you are, we're not all right in the things that we do, and a lot of what we do is not right, it's sin, but he still loves you, it's so much easier to begin to respond to that love, and that's what God has called us to be. And so Asa, that's what he did. He strengthened his faith. He strengthened the country first in what they believed. Why? Why do we need to strengthen our faith? Because let me tell you, you're going to be challenged. 
I, I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. You know, uh, when I first came to know Christ, I thought, oh, this is great. I'm not going to have any problems anymore. You know, Jesus is here. Everything's going to go perfect. You know, life is just going to be a dream. And why doesn't everybody do this? Well, guess what? <laughs> you know, it's not true. We face trials. We face dark times, as Pastor Jonathan says. We, place, uh, we face times of great difficulty. How do we stay strong? The same thing that you've heard over and over again. Read the word. Know the word. Let it be in your life. The word is alive. It's active. It's able to cut through. We need to be praying. We need to be spending time with God. We need to be in church. We need to have the, communica the communion with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Listen to Acts 2. Acts 2, when the, the day of Pentecost came, and the people, the church, the early church began to grow. This is what they did. Acts 2.42, this is out of the Passion. It said, every believer was faithfully devoted to following the teachers of the apostles. In other, they were faithful to the word of God. They didn't have the Bible written like we have now, but they were listening to the apostles' teachings, and they were following the word of God. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another, sharing communion, coming together regularly for prayer. 46. Daily they met together in the temple courts and in one another's homes to celebrate communion. They shared meals together with joyful hearts and tender humility. They were continually filled with praise to God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord kept adding to their number daily who were coming to the Lord. You know, they became, church became their community. Other believers became their life. Because guess what? We can't make it on our own out there. It's never going to happen. We need the strength that each person can give us, and we need the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ working among us. And that's what they did. So Asa did. He, he, he went, went and began to reform his country. And I would say Asa was on fire for God. And let me just say, say one little thing. People say, well, what do you mean you're on fire? Well, that means you have a burning, uh, a burning desire inside of you to see reform and to see things happen and to change your life. But there's something I learned about fires. Well, at least I'm not sure about the great forest fires that are out west and whatever. But I grew up camping. And we had lots and lots of campfires. I had bonfires all my life. And I found you could start a great fire. Man, that thing could burn. You could be huge, do with the right sticks, the right you know, paper, the right combustion, uh, put the match to it. That thing will burn. It's great. But guess what? If you let it go and you don't tend it, it fizzles out. And, you know, it's the same thing with our faith. If we don't tend to it, it just begins to fizzle out. I, I just put three scriptures here really quick for you. They're just for references. But all of them, 1 Corinthians 16, Colossians 4, 1 Peter 5, they all say, watch, be alert, do something. Because the devil is prowling around to attack us, to get us to leave the fold. He, you know, it's, it's like the wolf. He wants you, the sheep to lead the fold. So he, why? He can attack. He can destroy. And that's what happens to us. We need to watch, watch, stand fast in the faith. We need to continue steadfastly, being watchful. We need to stay alert, watch out for the great enemy. God is calling us to strengthen our faith. That's what he's calling us to do. Okay, let me go on with the story. So it's been about, I, I think, somewhere around 10 years that they've had peace. And now Asa faces a huge challenge. It's an assault on his faith. Because the king Zura of Cushites, the, of the Cushites of Cush, which uh, uh, or Kush, whatever how you pronounce that, Dennis shall correct me later. Um, <laughs> he, they they're from uh, Africa, from around Ethiopia. With this king Zira, he had a massive, massive army. I'm talking about much, much bigger than King Asa. And he attacked him with a million men, large shields, spears, bows. He had chariots. Judah did not. And back then, the chariots were the technology, the upcoming technology, okay? But he was attacking Asa. Now, there was no way that King Asa could defeat them. There's, there's absolutely just no way. And so what did Asa do? 
his first response, you need to hear me, his first response was to go before God and cry out to God. He didn't first response go to military strategy, which there's nothing wrong with. His first response, which you do need in time of war, you need all this stuff, political alliances, whatever it is. But his first response was to go to God. And I thought to myself, what is my first response when anything comes against me? My first response a lot of times is to run to something else to fill that void. But his was God. And he says this amazing, beautiful prayer. And I'm not going to read it, chapter 14, 11 to 13. And it's a prayer not about him. It wasn't, oh, my God, this is happening to me again. Why do all these things happen to me? God, I just can't take this stuff anymore. You know what? This just isn't right. This just isn't fair. No. He begins to cry out to God for his people, and he begins to thank God for his character and that he's a faithful God. He begins to declare that God is the one in control. And guess what? He doesn't tell God how to solve the problem. I, I, which is amazing because I think to myself, there are so many times I get in a situation or maybe you have a loved one that's not serving God or something, and you right away you think, oh, my goodness, so-and-so speaking. I got to get that person there. I know when they come to that, they, oh, they're going to be changed. There's no way that they can leave that service without change. And then you manipulate, connive. You get that person there. And what happens? The person says, yeah, it was all right, you know. <laughs> get your hands off. That's what Asa did. And anyways, he has great victory. It says that he, um, he, he had great victory. He sent the people back to their country. Uh, he had great faith. But I really believe because he had built his faith and he was so used to calling out to God, he immediately did that. There's a, um, a missionary, George Muller. He says, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There's no glory for God that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's powers end. And you know something? Asa knew his powers had end. He was king. He had a great army. He would built up his country. But he knew it was no match for him. And sometimes when we are in that place, even as Pastor Jonathan, in your dark place, you do not have the power. Man does not have the power. Guess who does have the power to interview? Our Lord, our King of kings and Lord of lords. Come on. He's a great God. So the story goes on. Ace is on his way home. And Azariah, the prophet, comes to talk to him. Now, you would think after such a great victory, Azariah is saying, hey, man, you are awesome. You're the man. You did it great. I mean, look what you did. You defeated our enemy. You, you just are wonderful. No, he didn't come and say that. He didn't say anything like that because it wasn't about Asa. It was about God. And what Asa does is he begins to talk to him, and he begins to challenge him. And he basically says, you know what, Asa? Don't get lazy. You're on your next leg of faith journey. You need to continue to recommit your life, which is point number two, continually recommit your life to God. He goes, don't stop now. Don't kick your back and say, oh, well, we have this great victory. We're just a great country. We can just, we can just go on now. No, he says, you better beware. And he actually says to him at one point, he says, if you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. Now, that's a little confusing because I know God never abandons me. I know that God is always with me. Here's the problem. The problem is, is that we don't reach out for his help. Guess what? He can't help us. We tie his hands sometimes for him to intervene because it's all about us and it's all about what we want. And it's not about glorifying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so um, he says to Azariah, don't let that fire go out. Tend the flame. So point number two, continually recommit your life to the Lord. It's not a one-time thing. And so he, um, 
Azariah, it's interesting because he goes on to talk about Israel and Israel's dark times. And he says there were times in Israel where there were no priests and there was nobody to teach the people. There was nobody to instruct the people. And he says in chapter 15, verse 5, he says, During those dark times, it was not safe to travel. Problems troubled people of every land. Nation fought against nations, city fought against cities. For God was troubling them with every kind of problem. Man left to themselves find themselves in much trouble. That's never God's intention. But he says in verse 7, this is a powerful verse, but as for you, be strong and courageous, for your work will be rewarded. He really gives a word. Azariah says to King Asa, Asa, listen, be strong and and courageous in the Lord. Don't forget about him. Don't get lazy. Don't just get too busy and forget about your God. Continue to develop your faith. And so how does Asa respond? He obeys God. And he begins once again to go to the land and tear down idols and tear down the pagan shrines. And here, here what was interesting to me. Ten years ago, he did that. He tore everything down. And now he finds himself having to do it again. Let me just say to you, idols have a, have a way of creeping back in without us realizing it. In fact, I had heard a great definition of an idol. It was in our Bible study we're doing on Tuesday nights. And it's anything we constantly think about or run to for comfort and companionship. Just think about that. Anything we put before God. When something happens, I mean... Some of us run to addictions and whatever the addiction might be. Some people just run to other people. They put, their, they put their trust in all these other people, their trust in money or whatever it may be. If we're putting those things before God, guess what? They're idols. Back then, there were the actual statues and gods that they bowed down to. And here he is again having to tear them down one more time because they have a way of creeping back in. And so what Asa does is he calls all the people together, and he has a major sacrifices. And in verse 15, it says, all in Judah were happy about this covenant. For, um, excuse me, let me read verse 12 first. Then they entered into a covenant. Let me just tell you, a covenant is more than just an agreement. A covenant is like a covenant in a marriage. You don't break it. You keep your promise. Okay, so they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God with, uh, of their ancestors with all their heart and soul. Verse 15, all in Judah were happy about this covenant. All in Judah were happy. That's, that's like blows my mind. For they had entered into it with all their heart. And they earnestly sought after God and they found him and the Lord gave them rest from their enemies. Unbelievable. Great revival happens. It, the, the country is re and restored again. And you know what was interesting? People from Israel began to come to Judah because they saw something happening there. Let me just tell you, when you get a flame burning in you, people are drawn to it because they want something and they need something. And we have the answer in Jesus Christ. So it goes on, and it's, uh, now we're on chapter 16, and it's in the 36th year of Asa's reign. I don't know what happened through all those 20-some years um, so when they made the covenant. I'm sure he was working at tearing down all the idols and all those things. But he is challenged again. And the king of Israel, Baasha, he actually comes against King Asa of Judah. And what he does is he goes to the city of Ramah and he fortifies it. He, he builds walls. He puts an army there. And there was one purpose for that, they say, was to prevent anyone from entering or leaving Judah. He was blocking off Judah. The king of Israel, he said, forget it. I, I, don't, I do not want these uh, people coming and crossing back. My people are not going down there to Judah. And so now Asa is faced again with uh, Israel themselves attacking them. And, is, and Asa's response was not a good one. I don't know why. I don't know if fear had taken hold of him. I don't know if it was years of peace or just... I'm sure, he, don't get me wrong, he had trials all the time. We all do. But this was something major upon his country. And he, he um, I don't know what made him do that, but what he did was he went to the temple and he took all the treasuries of the Lord. And he says, you know what? I'm going to pay off a pagan king for help. He doesn't turn to God. 
He decides he's going to go to a pagan king, and he's going to get the help he needs. And so he does. And the king he goes to is Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad is actually has a treaty with Israel to attack Judah. Now the king of Judah is going to go to King Ben-Hadad, and he's going to pay him off to turn to his side so they could attack Israel. Crazy, right? And that's what he does. And Ben-Hadad says, sure, why not? You're going to give me all this money? I'm going to fight for you. And guess what? They're victorious. Oh, God is so good. He, he gave him great victory. And King Asa, he's happy. Wow, this, this whole thing worked. This was wonderful. Until the prophet comes. Another prophet. Verse 7 to 8 in uh, chapter 16. At that time, Hanani, the seer, which is a prophet, came to King Asa and told him, because you have put your trust in the king of Aram instead of the Lord, your God, you have missed your chance to destroy the army of the king of Aram. What was he saying? He said, yeah, you had victory over Israel. But just imagine if you had put your trust in me. Not only would you have it over Israel, but you have an enemy out there in Aram. You would have had victory over them. He said, now you're going to pay the consequence, which they did. And so the prophet goes on and he says this. He goes, don't you remember what happened to the Ethiopians, the Libyans, and the vast army with all their chariots and charioteers? At that time, you relied on the Lord, and he handed them over to you. He says, I, I help you. I help you in everything. Don't you see that how, how major miracles I've done? And this is what verse 9. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. That scripture's for us, man. Do you understand how much he loves you and how much he wants to help you? How much he wants to strengthen you? All he's asking us to do is to look to him and give the things over to him. Look at it. It's so much easier. You know, we walk sometimes in such turmoil, at term, a turmoil in, in our hearts, and we're not at peace. And the reason we're not is because we're just struggling how to solve all these problems. But if we can learn to tap into his strength, if we can learn to tap into the Holy Spirit, it says the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Look at problems don't go away. I've been dealing with things for years, praying for loved ones for years, dealing with issues in my own life for years. But you know what? God gives me grace and peace and strength to face each day as I look to him. We have to look to him. And that's what the prophet says to him. Asa, why did you call out to me? Why did you go to God? Why did you go to a pagan king? He wants to help you. Matthew Henry says this. He says, it is foolish, a foolish thing to lean on a broken reed when we have the rock of ages to rely on. Isn't that the truth? Last point. I had, oh, let, let, let me just say this about Asa. Um, in his 39th year, oh, he got so angry at that prophet, he threw him into prison. And not only did he throw him into prison, he started to oppress the people because why? Anger, he didn't deal with his anger. And he got so angry that he, now his country was oppressed because of Asa. And it says that later in his life, he got a very bad foot disease. And it says he didn't even ask God to help then. Isn't that amazing? And then, of course, a couple years later, he dies. What happened to Asa? Number three. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. I actually get this out of Romans 12, too. It says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within. I don't know what happened to Asa. I don't know why his reaction was to just look to the world and a pagan king to help him. I do know that in reading this, I saw that even when Asa was tearing down all the idols and things, he didn't do it completely. He left some up in the cities. He left some around the areas. And I don't know if through the years he just got lazy, he just allowed sin to take over, but his reaction 
the last, the last part of his life was to help, get the help of a pagan king. And you know what? God still loved him. That wasn't the issue. And, the, and Asa really still loved God, as we see that they say that later on in, in 1 Kings, that he, was, he loved God the, all days of his life. But his decision affected him, the people around him, and his country. In fact, I, I wrote here, I, you might have heard this before, but sin will always take you further than you plan to go, make you stay longer than you want to stay, and pay more than you want to pay. That's what sin does. And you know, um, his decision to ask King Ben-Hadad to help him, years later, Ben-Hadad came and terrorized Judah, took tons of plunder, just stripped their land, and took many Jewish people to be slaves in his country. So his decision back then, if he would have did call on the Lord, the Lord would have helped him to defeat both of them. And now he was faced with that. So, um, you know, the, the prophet, it's amazing, the prophet says to him, how could you have been so foolish? Why didn't you call out on the name of the Lord? And I think of uh, Paul in the Galatians 3.3 says this. He says, how foolish can you be? Now, Paul is talking to us. How foolish can you be? After starting your new life in the spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own effort? And i got to tell you this, I think what King Asa did, it went to his head. And he thought he could do it on his own and ask the help of the other people. Now, listen, I'm not opposed to asking the help of other people or to go to a physician or a doctor or to get financial advice. That's, we need all that. But our first response should be to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's what he's calling us to be. I'm going to ask the band to come up. I'm going to end with reading Romans 12 again. But I want to read verses 1 and 2. It says, with eyes wide open to the mercies of God. Paul's speaking. He's saying, look it. Open your eyes. The mercies of God. He loves you. I beg you, my brothers and sisters, as an act of intelligent worship, your worship, your, your faithful, intelligent worship, listen, is to give him your bodies a living sacrifice, consecrated, set apart to him, and acceptable by him. Paul's begging them. He's saying, look it. This is where it's at. Give yourself wholly to God. Give your bodies, your mind, your soul, your will, your emotions to him. Let him control them. And he says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you, listen to this, that you may prove in practice. What does it mean in practice? By the way you live. That people would see it. That you're going to prove by the way you live, how by the way you respond, by the way the decisions you make. He says that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good. Do you understand his plan for you is good? It meets all his demands and moves you toward the goal of true maturity. That's what God has for us. Listen, I, I am just challenging you guys today. Get strong in your faith. We live in a tough world. There's so many trials and tribulations that are hitting us on all sides, and they can be from anything from addictions to relationship problems to financial problems to, to whatever that we're facing. And now there's such an assault against our faith and about Christianity. Get strong in the Lord. Do what the first disciples did. Make God the priority in your devotions and getting together and to coming to church. That's my challenge for you today. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the word of God that encourages us and instructs us. And God, I thank you that you are a faithful God. I thank you that you love us, that you love everyone that is sitting here today. And Lord, I pray that, that you would give them the grace and the strength, each person here, each person listening, to be all that you've called them to be. Lord, I really pray they'd fall in love with you. Because when I really, really fell in love with you, I would have done, I'd, I'd do anything for you. 
because I love you and I know you love me. And Lord, we fail. We fall sometimes. We make wrong decisions. Asa made a wrong decision, but 1 Kings tells us that he remained um, faithful to God all the days of his life. So I got to believe that that he still loved you, that, and I know you still loved him, and it's the same with us. Lord, you never leave us nor forsake us. Help us not to tie your hands so that you can give, a, give us your full help and your full strength. Lord, I pray that you would pour upon each and every person here your strength, your goodness, and that, Father, that as the days and weeks go ahead, that they would not be conformed to this world, but they would be transformed by the renewing of their mind in your word. Father, I thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.